Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Pori Ranch stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! The first one is titled, Try to Prank Me? Good luck getting your camper back with a lot of cash. My wife's best friend I'll call Karen. A harpy from hell, she makes everyone, even my wife sometimes, miserable. She also thinks she is smarter than everyone and just stuck up enough to believe no one would dare cross her. So, a friend of ours, I'll call Bill, bought a piece of property next door to us. He had a bad car accident in November and lives an hour away. He made me a legal agent of the property, which means I have almost as much power as he does, think property manager. It has a small house on it that is unoccupied, but I keep an eye on things. He bought the property only because next to the house is a big asphalt parking lot. It used to be a lot for a small used car company. His reasoning was that during the bad winter months he could park equipment and trucks from his other companies there. So he also had me put up huge, no parking. Violators will be towed at owner's expense, signs all around it. Moving on. So Sunday I'm elbow deep into a RC submersible when my wife bursts into my study yells for me to listen to something. I take the phone and who is doing a live video? Karen. Karen was talking about how she was going away for a few days, this was Sunday morning, because she was so stressed out from always giving people advice and helping them through their problems etc and then she mentioned, again, why my wife told me. She talked about how she parked her 46 foot 5th wheel $35,000 camper next door to me, and seeing Bill was unreachable this week, I would have to look at it for the next 3 days. As a reminder that she is not only smarter, but 10 moves ahead of me and I'm an idiot because I wouldn't loan her a truck and it cost her money to rent one. Turns out she told her husband, who is gone during the week for work, that she had Bill's permission to put it there, so early Sunday morning he towed it over there. I was upset, she has a tendency to lie so I went outside, and there it was. Parked right there, in the middle of the lot was her camper. I actually smiled because I had a perfect plan. As being a manager of the property, I also had a right to have any vehicle towed off there. Including that one. I had two options call Garage A owned by a nice guy, doesn't charge the state maximum for the tow and storage fees. Explain what happened and he might cut you a break. Then there is Garage B he doesn't care if he has to tow your car 15 feet, he is charging you the max and always charges the maximum storage fees. So you're damn right I went with Garage B called the guy, gave him my name, told him I manage the property and bring a fifth wheel, he had it gone in less than a half hour. This is the best part yet my friends, I didn't tell her it was towed until yesterday morning. Yes I waited from Sunday afternoon till Tuesday morning. Yesterday morning she is on Facebook live streaming from her car talking about how was going to go visit her camper for another laugh. Then I got on live, my wife sent her a message to get on my live stream like now. And post the link to my page. When she was viewing I said this. Hey Karen. Hope you had a wonderful time. I have to tell you something, I had your camper towed. With me being the property's manager and Bill being unavailable I had to have it towed. We can't let people think they can just park on there illegally. XYZ tow has the camper. I was going to call you Sunday but you seemed so stressed out that I thought you deserved the break. I mean the camper is safe that's all that matters right? Well FB lit up like a Christmas tree. As I had hoped those watching her stream followed because, well they were curious too, and then the messages started. A few condemned me, but most were supportive. Some thought it was about time someone showed her that she wasn't all powerful and no one was scared of her. Then it went quiet. Now a normal person might be upset, but understandable, but she went the wounded Karen route. That afternoon she got back on again. She was crying, fake crying, about how it was going to cost her over $2,000 in fees because her husband wouldn't be back till Friday to tow it back and could someone please do it for her. A bonus I was hoping would happen. And that if she started a GoFundMe page would people donate to help her pay the fees. The answers to that were between, no, and, hell no, but hey, she didn't threaten to sue me at least right? Side note, Bill is unavailable this week, except to certain people, which I am part of. I called him and told him the whole story his answer was exactly, good. You want to play games then be prepared to lose, the camper is still there. No one volunteered to get it. 
A few said they would for gas money, but she tried to play it off as it would be helping her and she owed so much in fees and that she would owe them a favor. A favor no one could collect on because she has nothing to bargain with. The next one is titled, the owner is painting this unit, I know that's what I'm doing. So I'm remodeling the four units on the second floor of an apartment building I own. I subbed out the painting for three of the units, I'm working in the fourth. I hear the painters arrive and greet them at the top of stairs. I've never worked with this company but I'm happy to see a few familiar faces. Tess gives me a hug and Jorge a nod. They recently lost their job when the contractor they worked for died unexpectedly. I'm glad you guys found work so fast, how is it? She says the crew is great but the manager is kind of a tool. He likes to yell a lot, a lot, I hear there's lots of turnover also. We all get to painting. All the doors and windows are open on this floor because it's hot AF. After hour of painting I hear, yelling. I think oh the tool must have arrived. One of the crew says, no this is the right color, look it's right here on the schedule. Mr. Tool says, oh it must have been changed, it haven't. More yelling, mostly stupid stuff. Tess is in the unit across from me. She gets my attention, points at the unit where the tirade is coming from and mouths, see what I mean. I shake my head and we go back to work. What is this guy's problem? A few minutes later I hear very loudly, what the hell are you doing? I look up to see Mr. Tool glaring at me. I answer, painting. The building owner is going to paint this unit. Me, I know that's why I'm here. Are you ducking stupid, I said the building owner is painting the unit. Tess comes to see what is going on and another painter tries to stop Mr. Tool. I answer again, I know that's why I'm in here. Mr. Tool then turns to the painter that's trying to stop him and yells, get back to work. The painter pauses for a second, looks like he may say something, Mr. Tool yells, now. At this point I'm upset, not about how he is treating me but how he is treating the crew. No one should have to work with this kind of idiot. I take some deep breaths and go back to my painting, I'm going to let this play out. Mr. Tool, this space is not our job, stop painting. Has anyone ever told you that you're really loud? Stop painting, me, see what I mean, very loud. Maybe you have a hearing problem. Listen Tard I'm not paying you to paint in here. Me, that is true, you are not paying me to paint in here. What is your problem? Me, I don't like loud buttholes that yell at people for no reason. Trolling Mr. Tool is kind of fun but he is getting pretty upset at this point. I have every reason to yell at you. The building owner is painting this unit. Yes, I am. I'm surprised that he still doesn't get it. I go back to painting. Stop painting. Tess tries to interrupt. Mr. Tool spins around holding his finger in her face, don't say a word, all you new painters are still in your probationary period. He turns back to me. That includes you and you're in thin ice. I have to admit this was a pretty small butt move, ice sounds great. I walk over to my cooler, grab a piece of ice and rub it on my forehead. Mr. Tool is shaking and about to hyperventilate at this point. I pick up my brush and continue to paint. Mr. Tool, stop painting. Me, no, I like to paint. Do you like having a job? Me, do you like having a job? That's IT, pack your shit, you're out of here. Me, the next time you yell consider yourself trespassed. You can't trespass me, this is my job. Me, not for long it isn't, and you're officially trespassed, please leave. Me, are you going to leave or do I need to call the cops? Mr. Tool stands there for a minute, confused. Tess, he is the building owner, that's what we were trying to tell you, he owns this building. Please leave the property. Mr. Tool tries to apologize. I'm not looking for an apology. Me, what makes you think it's okay to speak to anyone that way? Please leave now. I walk towards him and point to the door at the bottom of the stairs. Mr. Tool leaves. I call the painting contractor and ask him to come to the job as soon as possible. We all had a great time wait for the contractor to show up. They were still working but much more jovially. When the contractor arrived we explained what happened. It turns out Mr. Tool is the painting contractor's son. I tell him that he had a great crew, they work hard and are good at what they do. They shouldn't have to deal with behavior like that. It's unacceptable. The contractor said he's had a lot of trouble with his son's behavior. I say, the best thing you can do for your son and your business is to fire him, he needs that. If you don't it's just going to get worse and these people don't deserve that. 
Mr. Tool was fired two days later. So the contractor has several crews around the city and Mr. Tool just drove from job to job terrorizing the workers. I bet the turnover gets much better now. The next one is titled, Theft Isn't Victimless and yes I did take it personally. This was about two years ago while I was living at my buddy's place. His place wasn't in the best part of town, so theft happens all the time and for the large part most of these crimes are met with a sucks to be you attitude from the police who then create a report and forget anything happened entirely. Okay, so I wake up early on Thursday morning with a call from my roommate who was running to work at 5am and he explains the detached garage has been broken into. The thief broke in through the window and stole a bunch of stuff with highlights being Milwaukee drills, motorcycle jackets, and the receiver and the sub from one of those surround sound systems in a box, packages deals but leaves the speakers around the rest of the place. Saying I was livid is an understatement, I work hard for my things and have no intention of replacing them so some idiot can sell them for a very small profit. So for roughly then next 4 days my focus is entirely on this and you'll see why shortly. So, I know the chances are slim that I will ever find my stuff, but hey it can't hurt to look for it on the common online sales places. I used eBay searching local sellers only and I put alerts on Craigslist, an extremely handy feature, and I tell my roommate to keep an eye on Craigslist since he has a little time. So fast forward to Friday my roommate calls me up and tells me he thinks he found our stuff on Craigslist. I pull up the ad and sure as crap there it is. This beautiful not too bright gentleman had taken all the stuff he took from us and put it into a single ad in the barter section of Craigslist. He even added the model numbers, not serial numbers, making things very easy to identify. The giveaway was this cheap surround sound system for which he only had the receiver and the sub and after a quick search reveals this particular system is only sold as a package. You can't buy the single components, so this was definitely our stuff. I called the police, thinking case closed but guess what they don't care that I found this stuff on Craigslist and after about 20 minutes of complaining on the phone with non-emergency they ask me what they want them to do. I say, send a car over here I want to speak with someone directly. So they reluctantly send a car with a very nice officer, she was nice I'm sarcastic but she was really nice, who runs the number associated with the Craigslist ad and guess what he's got a rap sheet a mile long and has been arrested like 10 times for theft. With the break in the case I think I'm home free. But nope the cop can't do anything, the investigator needs to take care of this, she says and leaves. So I call the investigator who doesn't work on Fridays. I ask who I can speak with so they send me up to the investigator's team line to which no one answers at all. I try again on Saturday and learn investigators don't work weekends at all and I'd have to wait until Monday before I can talk to my investigator. Good thing crime doesn't happen on weekends otherwise cops weekends would be in trouble. So I call on Monday and sergeant, drags his feet is out sick. It was at that point I was done trying to call them. I drove to the police station and demanded to speak with an investigator. I mentioned to this new investigator the situation and the name of the guy who was in the Craigslist ad and the cop knows him very well and has arrested him on a couple occasions. The cop is confident the police can now help me since I've already done all the dang work here. Finally the cops tell me to make a meeting with this guy and let him know when and where. So again the work is on me, and to meet this guy, thanks police. So I text him a few times with no response, then I call him and joke around and express interest in a variety of items most of which are mine but a few that aren't. Since simply asking for the things from one of the victims is suspicious in my mind. So I tell him I'm Christmas shopping. I then say I'm from out of the area and ask him to pick the location and he lists off a few places one of which is a grocery store within eyesight of the police station. So I pick that and laugh to myself at how this is turning out. I call the cops let them know the deal is on and when and where it is. They say they'll be in an unmarked car and that I should take my wallet out as a sign to swoop in to make the arrest. So I pull into the parking lot I see no cops and I stop and wait, I think the guys are no show when he finally shows 10 minutes late. My heart's pounding at this point. I get out meet the mastermind criminal and shake his hand. He proceeds to pull out my stereo, then my drills and a few other odds and ends. And before I can get my wallet out a gold tower speeds in and out population three cops with guns drawn and cuff the guy. When this happened I just like turned around and walked away for a second while they put him in the car. The lead cop asks me if this is my stuff and I say yes it matches with the previously provided, very detailed, description I gave the police. All the while the guy in cuffs is yelling that's my stuff. 
Finally the cops get the warrant for his apartment find the rest of all of our stuff and a few other people's things. And I have all my stuff back by Wednesday the following week. He received 1.5 years in a state penitentiary for his efforts. I kind of fixate sometimes and he got unlucky by stealing from someone who didn't just claim renter's insurance. The next one is titled, Try to pin me for illegal deductions? That's a padlin. This occurred about three years ago. I shut down my framing company to pursue a job as a site supervisor for the development I had been building in. Started with the builder after I had built the last house and managed to get three out of four of my guys a job with the builder so they wouldn't be affected my decision. The fourth guy was a piece of crap, who I never fired because his work ethic was awesome, but had a terrible attitude, bad habits, and was wildly hated by the rest of the crew. He was only there because he made me money. Sorry. First couple months go well, my three guys have settled into doing more than just framing, though they were not enthused about certain tasks, but who really likes working in a muddy hole, or highly physical labor tasks. My guys were always dirty. Always wore shitty clothes to work, as did I who wants to destroy a nice pair of jeans, or a new clean white t-shirt, by getting them stained, or torn. So, our professional look left a little to be desired. After a while, the owner thought our mishmash of a crew needed some cleaning up. I've always subscribed to the analogy, gotta crack an egg to make an omelette, so I wasn't personally concerned about our outward appearances, our work should speak for itself. I'd saved the builder $9 per square foot, per house, and I could see he was happy about that. Under my direction, the rest of the trades had increased the quality, without any incurred cost, and our houses just looked better than competitors, during construction. I get called into a meeting, halfway through the week, and the owner says, I'm tired of you guys looking like no one owns you, your work attire should reflect the quality of homes we're building. Here's a bunch of uniforms, enough so everyone has one to wear every day, and an extra in case you work Saturdays. I say, hey boss man. That's a great idea. It'll make my guys feel more included and happier. You've even embroidered their names on everything. That's super cool. My guys were ecstatic. New shirts, pants, steel-toed boots, and steel-toed cold-weather rubber boots, jackets, hard hats, high-vise vests, you name it. All name brand, high quality stuff, supplied by the company. It was Christmas in July. Until they got their paycheck. Each guy including me, was deducted $1,357 for, uniforms, my lowest paid guy at $15 an hour, owed the company money. Next guy made $3.16. Highest paid guy? A cool $57, me? Well I received a check less my uniform deduction for a little over $2,500. I made more money building for him than I did managing his site. I was ducking furious. This is where the revenge comes in. I paid my guys for their deducted wage and then did some research. Guess what? Where I'm from, if you require an employee to wear a certain uniform, you cannot pass that cost off to the employee. It's to be supplied free of charge to the worker. This was also around the time I had been using my personal accounts at suppliers for odds and ends. I called for a meeting, printed out the Labor Standards Act, highlighting to pertinent areas, and explained to the boss, not only was it illegal, what they did almost cost my guys their homes. If I hadn't stepped up, they would have been evicted, child support wouldn't have been paid, and it could have been a lot worse. My boss took this all in, and said, it's not mandatory, that's why you guys have to foot the bill. I said, OK boss man, my guys can't afford to drop $1,357 on work clothes, so I'll have everything returned, most of it has never been worn, you can return what's still new, I'll pay the difference. We all went back to work, wearing our torn jeans, ripped shirts, and stained jackets. Problem solved right? Nope. I was fired two days later. Since they were, my guys, that meant them too. So rather than tell the guys what happened, I told them to roll up all my tools, and anything I had paid for, take Friday off, and I'll let everyone know what's going on over the weekend. Started back up framing that Monday, for the competing builder. But that's not where it ends. I filed a complaint with labor standards, filed a builder's lien on the 15 properties I had been managing for unpaid expenses and waited. When he refused to acknowledge any claim against him, I escalated to lien his personal home. I had done $25,000 worth of work to his home, which was to be paid after the sale, plus an extra 10% for waiting. That really got his attention, as his house was sold, pending the closing of the buyer's own property. 
The Leon made it so he can't sell, without paying me out first. I ignored all calls, except from his lawyer, and he essentially shut down business, and blames me for doing so. Long story short, I got my money, but to this day refuse his $25,000 for payment as it lacks the 10%, plus 3% per month late charge. He could sell his house, but he refuses to pay me out. Owes me about $56,000. Duck that guy. The last one is titled, and he ain't gonna jump no more. This story goes back to when I had first joined the army, 1995. As a new soldier out of basic I was sent to Fort Benning, Georgia for my first three-year tour. There I met the training sergeant of my unit whom I will call Sergeant J. Sergeant J was your typical buck sergeant, first grade of NCO that separates non-commissioned officers from lower enlisted ranks. Now while not all buck sergeants are jerks, there can be a few that let the sudden rush of a little power go straight to the head. This was Sergeant J. I had attended airborne school, parachute out of basic and I could not secure a posting with the 82nd write off so elected to do a tour at Benning in the interim. This was at the time rare because most soldiers that attend the airborne course either go to a jump posting or are acquiring jump training for a specific job, special forces, rangers, etc. Sergeant J off the bat did not like me for whatever reasons I still to this day cannot explain. He took every waking opportunity to make my young life very miserable. I think it had to do with me being airborne qualified as I had come to learn later he had tried several times to go, but washed out for whatever reasons. Now let me get to the story. Sergeant J was married. This I knew in passing conversations but had never met the gal. Q two months after I had arrived. Sergeant J came into the battalion HQ where I was on duty for the day. With him in tow was what I had assumed was his wife. I rendered the proper greeting to him and then said something to the effect of pleasure to meet your wife Sergeant. Only it wasn't his wife. And my young self was unaware of this. It was his girlfriend he was cheating on his wife with, and I had just unknowingly let the cat out of the bag. To top it off she did not know he was married. Cue the ensuing shitstorm that basically ended his marriage, but not his military career. I knew I was somehow going to be doomed. And that came in the form of his managing to get me on a year-long deployment to Kuwait. Now to some this would not have been the ideal thing. It wasn't for me right off the bat until learning that my enlistment bonus would be paid out while deployed which thus resulted in it being paid tax free. I wanted to travel to see places as well so it turned out to be a win. Now to the revenge. During this deployment of a year I went from private first class to corporal which is one rank before buck sergeant. I was offered to stay on another year in Kuwait which would afford me the opportunity to advance to sergeant. I took it and made my rank. Once this second year was over I came home with my stripes and returned to said unit. Sergeant J was still there and newly promoted to staff sergeant which is the next grade. To add to this he finally got his request to go to airborne school. Through the grapevine I had learned that Sergeant J had a hidden pension for marijuana, which of course is a no in the military. How he managed to escape coming up hot on the piss tests, who knows. In a twist of fate the unit sergeant in charge of scheduling and administering the drug piss tests was leaving for another posting. Seeing my opportunity I jumped on this, requesting through my first sergeant to take on this responsibility. Now there is no set schedule for these tests to be administered, and are generally scheduled on the direction of the unit commander. We were coming up on our mandatory brigade compliance and I knew that there was this concert event coming up that he was going to so, I scheduled a surprise test the morning after the concert. No one outside of the direct chain of command was aware of this test. Cue the next morning everyone is lined up drinking water and getting ready for this drug test. I can see Sergeant J is sweating bullets. A day later I get the results of the unit test and lo and behold. Sergeant J has not only come up hot for marijuana, but cocaine as well. Long story short. His 13 year career came to a very very quick close. Court martial, loss of rank to private and a dishonorable discharge from the army, and no coveted parachute school for him. And I have lost not one. Day. Off. Sleep. Thanks for listening.